the majority of my time at Greenland is working in the anterior segment unit, so that's um, with procedures similar to uh, Professor Charles McGee, uh, Sue Ormond, David Pendergrast, my other corneal colleagues at the university where we um, do the majority of corneal transplantation and um, anterior segment surgery, and then in private practice at Eye Institute. Um, what, I've, what I'd like to take you through today is uh, a, a little bit of a, a, a move away from just eye emergencies because the majority of eye emergencies, you can pretty well work out that this person, half their eye is on their cheek and there's an emergency situation and you know exactly what to do and it's just to get them out of your office into somebody else's care. So I'm really not going to try and waste any of your time with the horror pictures that you can see in most lectures about eye emergencies, but rather to address issues that I, hope will, uh, will, that I hope will actually be of practical use to you to know um, uh, how to manage your, ca your patients there in practical, uh, useful little tips about management of uh, eye conditions that from a patient's point of view is always the emergency as they come along to seek your help. So to start with, I'd just like to expand this from ophthalmology. Um, most of you will be well aware of the fantastic services that Greenlane attempts to provide your patients. Um, but there are other services uh, that are available to your patients. And importantly, uh, optometry is one that is regionally accessible, um, usually time efficient, uh, and cost efficient for patients. Um, so uh, to start off with, I'm just going to um, again repeat where services can be uh, obtained by your patients and so that you can offer them some useful assistance if you feel that added assistance is required outside your own services. So you're all aware of Greenland Clinical Center and the way that Greenland provides all of the acute services for all of the DHBs in the greater Auckland area. Um, that puts an enormous pressure on the service uh, and they've really stepped up over recent years to try and provide better and better services to you, the referrers, and to your patients. But uh, there are all too often long waits and triaging of patients at Green and Clinical Center is often a challenge to try and work out who are the very urgent ones and who are the ones with uh, adenoviral conjunctivitis that maybe uh, don't need to be seen quite as urgently. Um, as a result, there's often a long wait for patients uh, at Green and Clinical Center, but they will be seen. So every patient is seen during the day. Um, of course, it is manned by junior staff um, with a senior staff escalation involvement as things become more uh, involved, but uh, essentially the, the junior staff, and these are largely house surgeons um, and junior optometrists, will be the ones making most of the diagnoses and initial assessments. So in fact, optometry uh, in region, in clinics close to you, um, will provide almost always more skilled um, set of a diagnostic experience, uh, as well as um, people who are now trained to diagnose, manage and treat. So optometry, as you may well know, can now prescribe medications and most of the important medications for urgent eye care, including topical steroids and the rest, are, um, are prescribable by optometrists. And when it comes to uh, ACC patients, of course, they can go through to Green Lane, but your patients have more uh, access than that. Uh, they can see the local optometrist, so you could ring around your local optometry practices to find out who is ACC contracted. And most ophthalmologists in the region are ACC contracted. So uh, there is no part payment by any patient for these services. So uh, instead of going through to Greenland and waiting three to six hours, they will probably be seen within the hour or two uh, by a local optometry or ophthalmology colleague. So just to let you know that th those services are available and you may well want to ring around and find uh, who the local people are so your front desk staff know that um, uh, if the patient would prefer to be seen locally, uh, they, they can just give a local address and phone number. Um, this is a useful way of finding out where the local optometrists are, and you can just go to the website, the New Zealand Association of Optometry, and the nzao.co.nz site will be able to um, find the local optometrists, list them all for you, so that you can then... Uh, uh, get your front desk staff to uh, add those lists to patients so that they can actually contact them and uh, seek some alternative care uh, should you want the backup. You know, sometimes you, you, you think you've got um, corneal foreign body sorted with, but just want to make sure that there's no 
uh, anterior uveitis, iritis associated with this. There's no other associated problem at the back of the eye that you'd like to have some assistance, somebody doing a proper dilated fundal examination with our special lenses we can examine the fundus with. So those are easy accessible um, services through optometry or ophthalmology. So um, I'm going to expand the discussion from emergencies to, uh, uh, to not just our understanding of medical emergencies and surgical emergencies, but to expand it to what patients see as their emergency and what brings them uh, rushing into your practice so that they can seek a, a prompt, uh, efficient management of their eye problem. So a lot of this today will be useful tips and tricks that you yourself can put into practice and not necessarily what us surgeons do in our operating theatres with our fancy gear. So we're not going to spend much time on the latter. Um, so when are these, which of the patients are appropriate for you to keep um, and, and know when and how to refer the patients uh, in appropriate situations. So, you know, nail in the eye, bit of a no-brainer. Yes, it's an ocular emergency, um, but you've got a pretty clear idea about what's going to happen to that patient within the next 15 minutes. So we're not going to be spending much time on those sort of things. But we will spend more time on the bottom left-hand side. The bottom left, you've got patient with bilateral red eyes, okay? And the redness, the distribution of the redness is a really useful clue, okay? And this is something we can harp on for a little while because um, the distribution of redness here, you can see is kind of, it looks kind of confluent. It looks uniform. There's not easy distinguishable blood vessels there. And, and that's because this is subconjunctival hemorrhage here, okay? So subconjunctival hemorrhage is a, is a frightening thing for a patient to have, but of course we can sit back and relax straight away. And if you have access to magnification loops or a slit lamp, um, you can easily distinguish that this is subconjunctival hemorrhage. The second important point is the distribution of redness in the eye. So here we're talking about vascularization, okay? And where are the blood vessels most dilated and most prominent? Okay, and that's a really useful clue to the severity of underlying problem. So um, in a distribution here, you see that the least inflamed area of the ocular surface, this is, we're talking about the episcleral and scleral surface covered with conjunctiva, the least inflamed is around the limbus, okay? And the most inflamed is more peripheral and certainly in the palpebral conjunctiva, okay? So this is a typical scenario where you can sit back and relax some more. Okay? So this is a scenario where you know, well, okay, I know there's ciliary flush, circumlimbal injection. These are signs of glaucoma, iritis, keratitis, all the serious things, the itises that I don't like that I need to get out of here. They will all cause maximum inflammation around the limbus and less inflammation away from the cornea. Okay? So immediately you look at this and you say, okay, I think I'm, this, is a, this is a me sort of patient. I can handle this. I can almost straight away, just by observing this, I know that this is more likely to be a conjunctivitis, okay, with less likely to be anything seriously involving the patient's eye, intraocular contents, or whatever. Okay, so that's really where we're going to be spending most of the talk. And we're going to start with the very common corneal foreign body. Okay, urgent to the patient, but it's not something that you necessarily need to send off. In fact, in many of the emergency care facilities, urgent care facilities, you now have sit lamps. And, and I believe William was saying that sit lamp skills are a requirement now in the college. And so if any of you would like uh, extra sit lamp guidance and skills, do just ring your local optometrist or ophthalmologist. Um, certainly at our institute, we'd be very happy to take you through at a lunchtime. And all you really need is a good 15 to 40 minutes uh, with uh, somebody who's skilled to use a soot lamp and, and you'll be able to go find your way around that amazing instrument with great ease and skill and, uh, and be able to instill good confidence in your patients when using it. So that offer um, uh, stands with any ophthalmologist or optometrist in your region. So when it comes to foreign bodies, you know, it's useful to know how long ago this has all happened, okay? So we're trying to, if it's been a long while that the incident happened ago, we need to start excluding uh, ocular infection, corneal infection, 
periocular infection. Could this be an intraocular foreign body now with uh, associated endophthalmitis? What type of foreign body? Obviously, here we're most uh, interested in any metal-on-metal -metal, uh, incident, and whether this could be metallic, and in fact, whether it could be iron. So, of course, iron uh, has the most potential for causing uh, intraocular problems. So, siderosis, the iron poisoning um, within the eye can cause irreversible retinal damage, even though it's a very small fragment of iron. So that's why um, metallic and particularly iron-containing foreign bodies are of great interest to um, uh, those providing eye care. Velocity of impact is a really key point in, uh, in ascertaining what happened with the patient and what the incidence was that occurred. Uh, the higher the velocity, the greater the chance of intraocular penetration. Symptoms, largely we're looking for symptoms, the warning symptoms. So when it comes to symptoms that should be alarm bells for you and your front desk staff, photophobia is hands down the most important symptom for your staff to elicit from a patient. So if the patient is intensely light sensitive, photophobia, that's a very, very good sign that there's something more serious here requiring a sit lamp examination, requiring the exclusion, the active exclusion of iritis, glaucoma, keratitis. Those are the kind of key um, common problems that can be vision threatening that cause significant photophobia. And then of course it, it's helpful to include questions about eye protection and reinforce the patient. This could be a nice opportunity to reinforce a renewal of their eye protection um, if they didn't have one at the time. Visual acuity, of course, and magnifying loops are perfectly fine for most of these problems. You don't need necessarily to have access to a sit lamp, but certainly sit lamp examination um, will provide the best environment for not only your diagnostic um, stages, but also your removal of the foreign body. And I think the removal of foreign bodies um, should really be uh, comfortably within your territory. And we'll run through that in a moment. Then we have eyelid edema, um, the site of injection that could be an important part of the, uh, the diagnostic situation. So here we have a small foreign body, uh, and you can see the area of localized inflammation is in the same quadrant. So if you look at it an eye and you have a quadrant of inflammation, that localized inflammation will usually point you to where the pathology is. And of course you don't want to see this. So this here we have peaking of the pupil and now we have a little bit of brown tissue outside. And of course that is actually iris that is prolapsing through a corneal laceration. So the patient has had a penetrating eye injury. Uh, there may not be anything inside the eye. It may have been a, a, a sharp in and out injury but that sort of patient requires surgical intervention. Anesthesia. It's nice to have, particularly your patients will like you for it. Um, and it's, this is a useful point in that um, putting the drops in the inferior fornix is where patients need to put it, okay? But we know better and we can do better, okay? And that's because we know that if we put drops in the superior fornix, we're going to get better penetration of the drop, we're going to get quicker dilation of the pupil, we're going to get better ocular surface anesthesia, and we're going to get a happier patient. So where you can, let rest the patient back, get the patient to look down, and put a drop into their upper gutter, their superior fornix, and that will allow the drop to, uh, to take effect much more effectively. This is particularly the case with, uh, with uh, ocular surface trauma, with chemical burns and things like that. And that's mainly because these patients, when they're so sore, they're, they're squeezing their eyes closed. If you squeeze your eye closed, you have Bell's phenomenon, and your eyeball, your cornea, rotates upwards. So if you put a drop in the inferior fornix, what's already down in the inferior fornix? Our tear lake, okay? So as soon as you put the drop in, whether it's anesthetic or whether it's some drug, it's immediately half the strength, okay, straight away. So you put it into the tear lake, half of it's diluted out already, okay? Then what does the next patient, what's the patient do next? As soon as they close their eye, they squeeze their eye closed, right, and grab a tissue. So about two-thirds of the drop volume comes out at that stage. The cornea is now still up in the upper fornix because the patient's closing their eye real hard. 
okay? So the medication, and remember the medication only gets into the eye through the cornea. Medications don't get into the eye through the conjunctiva, through the inferior fornix or superior fornix. They only get into the eye through the cornea. So they've got to penetrate the corneal epithelium, the corneal stroma, and the corneal endothelium to get into the eye. Surface anesthesia is slightly different, of course, but those are the reasons why putting the drop in the superior fornix is a better position. The other reason why it's not such a good idea to put the drop in the lower fornix is because as the patient has uh, an ocular surface pain, they're tearing. Okay? And so if they're tearing because of vi viral conjunctivitis or a foreign body in their eye, all the tears come from the lacrimal gland, and that's washing down from superior to inferior. So all these factors of, uh, explain why inferior fornix is convenient for a patient, because that's the only one you can see when you look in the mirror, but we know better, and we can actually put drops in the superior fornix, so helpful, helpful to remind your, your uh, nursing staff of that point, and you find that your patients will be much more comfortable, much quicker, and you'll be able to then uh, obtain a better examination uh, of the ocular surface and establish a management plan. So with the corneal foreign body, we can really look at those that are central, paracentral, threatening eyesight, and those that are peripheral that are, are, are non-vision threatening. Um, the peripheral ones, you all keep those. Even this one here that has a slight infiltrate around it, removal of that, that foreign body, removal of the rust ring, all your territory, starting effective antibiotics, and you may choose, instead of chloramphenicol, you might choose something like ciprofloxacin, siloxin. Broader spectrum, gram-negative, but usually these lesions here are sterile. Okay, and that's usually because it's metal on metal, and a lot of that there's heat with with the um, uh, metal on metal uh, origin of the foreign body, and so that those are usually sterile. The paracentral ones, even though you might get the foreign body out and the rust ring out, I think it's a good idea to get those followed up by uh, your local optometrist or an ophthalmology service, public or private. Um, mainly because these patients will usually never ever see properly again. Okay? And you just don't want to have them pointing fingers or telling their friends that, oh, you know, I had my eye uh, seen to by uh, an acute care service and then my eyesight's never been back to normal again, I blame it on them. Okay? Meanwhile, the more people you have who can examine that and show the patient, look, you've got something now that's going to cause irregular corneal surface. That causes irregular astigmatism and will degrade permanently the, uh, the quality of eyesight in that eye. So even though they might get the same line on the Snell on the visual acuity chart, their visual acuity, their visual performance in that eye will never be the same. They'll notice there's a difference between the two eyes, particularly night driving and things like that. So, how do we manage this? Well, um, removal of the foreign body, no-brainer. Rust ring removal is often best done kind of day one, day two, day three. Okay, so if a patient does present a day or two after the incident, that's no great shakes. That actually helps you often in that that rust ring becomes a little kernel that you can kind of flip out a little bit more easily. The real nice trick is um, sterile instruments, 20 gauge or 23 gauge needle. Okay. So that's a wonderful sterile instrument that we all have in our rooms. Ciprofloxacin is probably the drug of choice rather than chloramphenicol here. And what you're looking for is not a complete elimination of all of the iron deposits, but what you're looking for is removal of the metallic foreign body and leaving just a little kind of dusting, if you like, a faint hint of any um, iron there, because that will eventually disappear. That small amount is fine to leave. You don't need to go digging away deeper. The, dibby, the deeper you dig away, the more likely you will cause scarring, and the more likely you will cause irregular astigmatism and drop in vision. Okay. So this is the trick. The trick is get your 20 gauge or 23 gauge needle. As you're actually removing it from the, the plastic casing, you, f you have the bevel up and just flick the end. So you deliberately twist, bend the end, and you create a little scoop on the end of your needle. Okay? That scoop on the end of your needle means that it is absolutely impossible for you to stick that into the eye, <laughs> number one. Okay, so you can be reassured that you're not going to do that, and, and uh, 
Uh, the other nice thing is that is perfectly shaped for a nice little scoop of any foreign body off the ocular surface. Okay? So you're not poking the tip in. It's a nice little sharp-edged scoop, and you're not really using the tip there much. Okay? So um, that's a really useful tip for, um, for removal of foreign bodies. And whether it's a 23 or 20 gauge really just depends upon what you find easiest. The other tip is you get um, the other end of the needle here, of course, is shaped like that. You just put a little cotton bud in the end of the needle. And then that makes a nice long instrument that's a disposable instrument. So you, 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 you scrape away a couple of scrapes. If the patient blinks, then you say that's fine. Into the sharps container, open up a new needle, and you're back into it. Sorry about that and you're back into it again. So you've got a nice disposable sterile instrument that, uh, that will do the trick for you. The other, the other useful thing is, uh, for particularly the ladies in the audience here, uh, an, an armrest. Okay? So you need something, that, and the most available thing is usually a tissue box. Just turn a tissue box upside down, elbow on the tissue box, and so you, you need to have this fixed to something. Okay, no good having your elbow up in the air, everything's shaking around too much, and especially with a patient who's anxious or in pain, you really want to have that fixed to something, your hand touching the side of the soot lamp over here, and then you can approach the patient from the side, um, and uh, you can get the patient looking wherever they need to look so that you can easily access the lesion from the temporal side. Whenever you see corneal staining that is vertical, you know that it's only come from one thing. That is something underneath the upper lid, subtarsal foreign body. So this is a classic appearance. You see that. You don't have to look anywhere else. you just got to flip the lid. Okay? Not as easy as it sounds. Okay? So eyelid eversion. There are a few little tricks. And then you're going to find this. So here are the tricks. So... Uh, this is one of the ones where you do actually need to just leave the gloves okay, off because it's quite difficult to do this with gloves on. Um, so wash your hands, uh, get the patient to look down. Their eyes are already anesthetized. Usually you've been there, had a look through things. You want to now complete your examination. Um, get the patient to look down, um, both eyes looking down without squeezing the other eye. Cotton bud right high up, the further away from the lash margin the better you're going to be able to evert the lid. So that's the biggest um, uh, failing that I see in my juniors at the hospital is that they place the cotton bud too close to the lash margin. You really want it up in the superior fornix so that you can evert the entire tarsal plate because that's what you're doing. So, you, so that, that tarsal plate is the collagenous tissue that you need to evert. Okay? And you can't evert half of the tarsal plate. You've got to evert all of the tarsal plate. And so the trick is grabbing the lashes, uh, the um, cotton bud right in the superior fornix, and it's a push and pull uh, that will evert the upper lid. And then you're in to find the, uh, the culprit, which is usually pretty obvious. Nice thing about this is that you can put your, you, you've already got fluorescein in the eye because you've examined the corneal surface. You put it onto the blue light on your sit lamp, and that will usually shine up any subtle foreign body because all too often it's a, it's a tiny piece of transparent plastic. Okay? Not necessarily metallic and easy to photograph, so I can show you here, but it's all too often something that's really subtle. And you know it's there because you've got some standing on the cornea, but with a white light you just can't see it. But with the blue light and fluorescein, any little piece of plastic there will shine up quite nice and easy. Sorry. Oops. Patience. So well, why are we waiting for that to decide what it wants to do? Um, can we open the floor for a few discussions, William, while we're just waiting for this?
Thank you. T talking about the e-version of the upper eyelid, yes. sometimes uh, in the, the books, etc., they talk about a double e-version. Right. Could you just explain that? Uh, that that's, double e-version is a, is a weird trick that if you're looking for something way in the superiphornics, you need to use a special instrument um, that is usually a, um, uh, a lid. Oh, hi. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a separate instrument that can look uh, further into the superiophonics than you can with an ordinary thing here. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult technique that needs a special instrument, so uh, it's probably outside the realm of this discussion today. Down there. Um, thanks. Uh, when, when you're trying to get a foreign body out, um, quite often we see guys that have come in uh, a, you know, a day or two down the track and it's quite embedded in the cornea. So the problem I always have is how hard and how much do you scrape away before you pull the plug and, and send them on to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist? And I, I don't know if you can answer that, but that's something that I'm faced with. And the other thing is, can you comment on dental burrs? Because we have a dental burr which is... We the frequently use, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so two points. The, um, I, I would be reluctant, definitely reluctant, to go picking away much. So you really just want a little scrape. It's a scrape, not a pick. You're not looking at removing actual tissue. Okay, you're removing that, the, the, the dead uh, collagen and the easy popped out uh, rust ring from the cornea, but you really don't want to be picking away too much. Because the more you pick away, the more you will cause scarring and irregular astigmatism. Um, the algo brush, that little burr thing, um, is, it has been very popular in the past. It tends not to be so popular, especially you never see any ophthalmologist or, or eye unit using it these days, mainly because it's very difficult to sterilize. And so the risk of transfer of fungal infection is high with those. Um, and secondly, it's, it's too tempting to burr away until you get rid of all of the iron dusting and you leave actually a much deeper, larger divot in the cornea that leaves the patient with much worse vision because they now have a distorted cornea and they need a corneal transplant to fix that. Next question. Yes. ADT. Oh, no, no, I, I've never heard that tetanus uh, injections are, are necessary for corneal foreign bodies. Um, no. Wonderful, thank you. I think we are up and running again now. So that's uh, removing of a subtarsal foreign body um, can be easily done with a little wet cotton bud. So the key there is to wet it. The, the wetter the cotton bud, the e more easily you'll be able to get something to stick to it. Also, the less likely you're going to get all these cotton strands stuck in the patient's ocular surface. And, and this is what it would be quite nice to avoid, a late presentation of a corneal foreign body that just caused a bit of irritation for this patient. But now, because of the, the long time period, and this is probably going to be two to three weeks the patient's had this irritation for, um, they've now got vascularization into that corneal, um, into the location where that foreign body is. But you can see there's no infection there. It's just a foreign body that's causing low-grade inflammation, and you get the secondary vascularization. Um, the next thing that I'll just run, run through is um, adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, again, not an emergency you need to refer off. Uh, only occasionally it is. But uh, this is something larger you can be managing yourself, and, uh, and there's some useful tips about how to get patients uh, much quicker resolution of their very debilitating conjunctivitis. And you know, we're moving closer into the winter season, so you'll be seeing your fair share of these. Um, we often, we usually have a front desk protocol, so these patients are nicely quarantined. So when patients come in with a, with a um, red eye, either unilateral or bilateral, and it sounds like it could be adenoviral conjunctivitis. We, the front desk staff, know to kind of gently remind them not to use all of our uh, magazines and sit them into a, an isolated area or a separate room so that they're not sharing equipment and all the, and all the gear with uh, other patients. 
Um, what sort of adenoviral conjunctivitis? Clinically, you don't really need to know the different names. But from, from a patient presentation point of view, only some of them will have the classic uh, pharyngeoconjunctival fever. Okay, and this is the one where you have the classic sore throat, you have your uh, localized lymphadenopathy, and, um, and this is largely the, the better sort to have. So if you have the lymph nodes there, you have a roaring red eye, um, have a roaring conjunctivitis, but they, tell, they seldom have any epithelial or corneal involvement. And that's where these patients tend to be the better off of the two. So this, this is the one where classically you'll see a very red eye, and uh, the conjunctivitis is that which is typically more peripheral, sparing around the limbus, um, and the patient has crystal clear corneas. So they, they don't have any features of any cornea involvement, and their vision is nice and normal. Down the track, the patient could come into trouble. And, uh, and so these are subepithelial infiltrates. These are after the patient has resolved from the acute episode, their red eye is gone, and then all of a sudden, they start noticing the vision is dropping off. The contrast sensitivity is not so good. And they'll tell you that, oh, they're driving at night. They're not so confident. They're light sensitive. They're light sensitive, again, because you've got keratitis. Okay? And again, you remember that photophobia is a sign that something could be going wrong, a symptom that something could be going wrong. And here, we have multiple corneal subepithelial infiltrates. This is a registrar from the clinic, who, uh, eye clinic, who, who ended up getting an infection from one of his patients. And, uh, and these can be very debilitating. And some patients get permanent scarring from this. Um, we manage this with uh, topical steroids initially. And because these are inflammatory infiltrates, not infective infiltrates, topical steroids will typically um, settle them down if they haven't yet become scar tissue. Okay. Um, later on, it can become permanent scar tissue, and the patient can have big issues with long-term vision. Well, the practice protocols are, of course, wiped down here, but the patient instructions are, uh, are just an educational side of things, really. So um, unfortunately, we've got, we know there's 12 days of viral shedding. So you've got adenoviral conjunctivitis. For the next 12 days, on average, these patients will actively be shedding that virus, and you know how easy it is to transfer it. So therefore, you know, in the textbooks, they say, well, you really need to have two weeks off work. Two weeks off work in our modern society is just huge, okay? No one has that, has that luxury of having time off work uh, or sick leave. And so often we're left compromising this, even though medically we know that's true. And there's a question here, a role of a diagnostic test, because, of course, there are ro roles for diagnostic tests. Um, from a health professional point of view, it's your, you and your staff. If you think you have developed adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis, um, we can get organized adenoviral PCR. Uh, that's done through the hospital or through any private clinic, and you can get a diagnosis in a day. Okay, so uh, that's an important feature to, to help guide you and your staff about time off requirements. Um, this is the, the new uh, RPS adeno detector. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, but it also in 10 minutes it tells you the diagnosis, whether you are positive or negative for adenovirus. So that can be really helpful in trying to help the patient uh, decide whether they need to be at home or back at work again. Vasoconstrictors, lubricants, that's been the standard of care. Okay, and the standard of care, unfortunately, has been very poor, mainly because health professionals do not want to see these patients back again. Okay, as nobody really wants to see these patients back in their waiting rooms because they're just going to um, increase the potential for spread of this virus. So, um, but we know there's 12 days of shedding time, up to two weeks off work. We can do better than this, and we can. Povidone iodine, okay, is what we're doing better now. Povidone iodine and topical steroids um, have been shown to be an extremely effective way at reducing the infectivity of these patients. Okay. So povidone iodine uh, basically extinguishes infectivity of free adenovirus. So it only kills free adenovirus in the tear film. It cannot, of course, kill uh, adenovirus that's busy replicating within the cells. So you put it on, 
it's, it's not just a once a treatment. You need to put repeated doses on the ocular surface. But it does it without any cytotoxic effect. Okay. And it's very effective against a vast majority of viruses and over a short period of time. Combining this with topical steroids have shown that the clinical resolution within uh, three to four days compared to two weeks. So that's a huge change in the natural history of this disease and something that uh, gets the patient back working decent again and, uh, and happy with her life. Okay. Um, the vast majority showed reduction in teeter of the virus within a very short period of time and elimination of activity um, within four days. And so that is, that is something that's made a big difference to the care of our adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis patients. So we now make up uh, for our patients, and the, uh, the hospital now does this. So um, I've shown the uh, Green Line Clinical Center how they can actually get these prednisolone minims. They've got these free sterile packages. We just inject 0.05 of a mill of 5% povidone iodine into the prednisone, uh, and give the patient these little ampules. The patient can then take it home. We don't want to see the patient back again unless they have visual symptoms. So that's the key thing. So if their eye is just red but getting a little bit better each day, um, then we're happy. We don't need to see them again. We want to see them if down the track, and this is anywhere over the next three months, they notice the vision in one or both eyes is just getting a bit foggy, that's when we'd like to see them back. But apart from that, they're gone, okay? but we're doing much better for them and they're much more able to return to normal lives uh, in a short period of time. So that's all they go, up, they, they go out with. Um, chemical burns, that's the other thing that we'll be presenting to you. Okay. Bottom line is front desk staff just need to know chemical burn comes in, uh, anything, any liquid at all. So if there's a phone call from a workplace or phone call from a patient, and there's clear history of chemical burn, if your front desk staff could tell them, get anything that's liquid and put it in your eye. Doesn't make any difference. If it's drinkable, if it's drinkable, drinkable liquid, just get it in their eye before they come in to see you. Okay, so that's probably the most important thing. When they come in to see you, sure, you're gonna be doing your examination, but the key thing is irrigation, irrigation, irrigation. So you will be doing that as your immediate management. And so the key thing is to have your staff know that um, phone calls come in, the staff member is given appropriate instructions for home irrigation, um, and then your staff member tells your necessary team to get a few things organized, and that's all you really need is, is some uh, irrigating sterile solution. And uh, this is a Morgan irrigating lens, and I think it should be basic equipment. It's a little um, disposable, inexpensive um, cup that once you put local anesthetic in the eye, you just hook it up to your, your saline bag and you go away. Okay, that's going to do the job for you. That, more than anything else, will rescue the patient's vision more than any ophthalmologist could do down the track. So here, time is of the essence. Closed globe. I'm just going to carry on for a few more minutes, and I'm, William, I'm going to open up. We can have some um, questions and answers. How's that sound? Okay. Um, what's that? Good. Perfect. Perfect. Um, blunt trauma. Question, could there be any blowout fracture? That's probably one of the key things. If there's a history of a potential blowout fracture, um, oral antibiotics is a good covering agent and then just monitoring that patient over time to make sure there's, there's good eye movement. So as long as there's normal eye movements, even if there's a blowout fracture, that should just settle down and cause no issue at all. So making sure there's no diplopia in any uh, quadrant of gaze is a key thing to make sure there's no entrapment of one of the extraocular muscles should the blunt injury have caused a blowout fracture. Hyphemas are, are obvious to identify. Uh, traumatic madriasis is something that's worthy of note, but actually doesn't make any difference whatsoever. You can't do anything about that. It just reflects the degree of uh, blunt trauma. Obviously, there are uh, more traumatic things that can happen to the anterior segment with, with dislocation of the lens, with ripping of the iris root, uh, and this can lead to surgical intervention that can return the patient to perfectly normal function. So if the rest of their eye is nice and healthy, uh, any cosmetic change to the iris or anterior segment can be easily these days remedied with ocular surface, uh, with uh, anterior segment reconstruction. 
So on that note, William, can we maybe raise the lights and we'll open the floor for some questions. Uh, just a question on the uh, adenovirus uh, treatment you mentioned. Um, in terms of uh, our practice, is it, would it be most useful to get an adeno test prior? That is, like, if, if there's, is there a chance that giving the prednisone is problematic if you're dealing with some other cause of conjunctivitis? Yeah, and the adeno, adeno detector is a great tool. So most optometrists and most ophthalmologists will have that available. I think in your units, in, in urgent care facilities, you know, that's, that's, that's a basic tool. Um, the eye department now has that also at Green Lane. Um, they're pretty simple, easy to do. If it's positive, it's great because it establishes the diagnosis. If it's negative, you're still a little bit wondering about what's going on. You've got a roaring conjunctivitis. You've got clinical features that are, that are pointing heavily towards adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis. In our practice, we tend to still manage that the same way with povidone iodine and, uh, and prednisone mixtures. Okay. Yes. I just want to ask about um, us giving, prescribing the steroids because um, in medical school we were, the fear of God was put into us for ever giving a steroid for a red eye. The, the devil's work, that's right. And, so, uh, I, and, and it's very true that topical steroids uh, can, of course, just be petrol thrown on a fire when it, if it comes to microbial keratitis. So if you feel there's any features, any suspicion of microbial keratitis, topical steroids should not be used. Microbial keratitis uh, is quite easily picked up. So there's, a, there's an infiltrate. There's a white, yellowy patch in the cornea someplace. And you almost always there's some fluorescein staining. Okay? So these patients we're talking about with roaring adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis, their corneas are crystal clear, pristine, non-staining. Okay, so uh, you know there's no microbial keratitis. Okay, uh, there have been studies on the point of topical steroids and adenoviral conjunctivitis. There have been studies that have shown that low-dose topical steroids, if used alone, can prolong the infectivity of these patients. So they reduce some of the symptoms. <laughs> but the shedding, the viral shedding, can be prolonged. And that's what you'd expect. If the immune system is not around to do its normal job in quite as a, an active a role, then isolated single use, uh, isolated use of topical steroids without the povidone iodine may well uh, lengthen the infectivity for the patient, whereas povidone iodine rapidly reduces the free virus in the conotava. So the problem then is with your patients who uh, we can't get these uh, single-use drops and the povidine, can we prescribe it in any way? Um, you can't prescribe it. There's no pharmacy that makes it up. Uh, these are made up by facilities and, uh, and... So where can we get it made up because we can't make it? You can't, you, you can't get it made up. We don't have the steroid drops? No. We can only get Maxidrex in the big bottle? Yes. So you, you either you buy a box of prednisolone minims, that's, that's the minims box that you can get from any pharmacy, and you do what is done at, the, at Green Lane and what we use, and you make it up yourself. Okay, and there's a little formula, and I would be very happy to share that with you. Um, so you can manufacture it yourself, um, which is what Green Lane does, which what I Institute does. Um, but that's, that's your choice. So there's, there's that option or you're looking at um, vasoconstrictors and conservative management, which has been the classic management for adenovirus. So, uh, can, can you um, put that down in a letter to the employer for companies like White Cross so we can actually get this? I, I'd be happy to give the formula. So, if you email me, be happy to write out and give the, the scientific evidence supporting this and saying that at this stage there's no manufacturing pharmacy that put it together. Um, there is one manufacturing pharmacy in Auckland. It's called Optimus. So I haven't approached them because it's such a simple thing for me to just make up uh, in the clinic. But this pharmacy may well be able to make them up for your patients. Uh, and they're a facility that provide that service. It'll be much more expensive, but they would be in a position to provide that service. I'll write that down also in my email to you.
Thank you for the question. This question. Uh, just about these things, can you ask them to give, uh, prescribe just a betadine? Can they put like one drop of betadine and uh, drops of uh, uh, steroid by themselves instead of mixing them with us? Yeah, the, the problem with that is that povidonidine, uh, betadine, stings like mad. Okay, so 10%, if you ever get that in the eye, it is like patients will never see you again. Okay, uh, 5%, which is the ophthalmic solution, we only ever use that after pouring in massive amounts of local anesthesia. Okay, so 5%, which is the ophthalmic concentration, half of the normal skin preparation concentration, is really stingy. So we end up with 0.05%. Okay, so, and that's been shown to kill the virus. So this, this is not as if it's subtherapeutic concentration of and iodine. It still kills virus at that low concentration, but it doesn't sting nearly as much because anesthesia is not something you want to ever give to patients. Corneal anesthesia is not something you want to give to patients. Can I just ask what age you would use that in? And secondly, if you don't use it in kids, because a lot of the time parents want to give something to, um, so their kids can go to daycare, and I find that it's a, you know, it's a big problem where I work. You know, it's the parents off work time that becomes the issue. So what about kids? Uh, with regards to adenovirus, the, the only effective treatment that I'm aware of is the povidonidine and the topical steroid. That, that, that reduces the natural history. Otherwise, you just, you just run it out its course. I, I see no reason why that can't be used in children. Povidonidine, perfectly fine in children. A weak topical steroid. This is the weakest manufactured topical steroid. Um, and it's for a short period of time. You only use it for three days, four days. Yeah. I'll put that slide up again. Can we go back several slides? Uh, I'll, sure, I'll just... Thank you, I'll just put that up there. So that's, that's our formula. Any other questions? Uh, three to four times a day. So each, what we try, ask the patient to use is one little ampule per day. Okay? And each ampule will usually contain about eight to ten drop volumes. And so that's what they use. One ampule per day. This is preservative free, so it's best to keep in the fridge. Uh, but not that anything's going to grow in a povidone iodine environment anyway. Yeah, a lot of the urgent care members will be aware of the CME sessions that we've been running at the Eye Institute, and we've had um, two to date, and there's a third one coming up soon, and they've all been fully subscribed. We've had um, 75 people sign up. So um, I think um, following on from Trevor's fantastic talk today and, and the um, success of the CME sessions, that we'll be running some more. So if anyone's interested um, from urgent care, please um, email me and let me know, and then I'll set up some more. Yeah, so I, thank I, you. I, I, I can vouch for you guys. It was a fantastic session, and the Eye Institute was a beautiful session. It's a lovely building you got there. Captain Thank, you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, guys. Thanks very much, Trevor. <laughs> See the iodine is